It now being 6 o'clock, I will call the uh, July 16th Board of Selectmen meeting to order. This meeting is being recorded for Cablecast and YouTube presentation by Area 58 Community Access Media. The video of this meeting is not to be considered an official public record. The item on our agenda tonight is a public hearing. Uh, I'm going to turn the moderation over to Slickman Russo, since he's our expert in this. <laughs> expert may be too strong a word. But thank you, John. Um, so uh, this is an official public hearing, and therefore there are some formalities we have to go through. I know there are a lot of people in the room and a lot of um, comment, but a um, couple things that we just have to do. And first of all um, is uh, reading the notice. Um, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. Notice of public hearing, right of first refusal, in accordance with the provisions of General Law Chapter 61A, Article 14. Notice is hereby given that the Plumpton Board of Selectmen will conduct a public public hearing on Monday, July 16th at 6 p.m. in the main meeting room at the Plumpton Townhouse, 5 Palmer Road, Plumpton, regarding the proposal to exercise the town's right of first refusal to purchase a certain parcel of land and the buildings thereon containing approximately 113 acres, more or less, described as Prospect Street, Plumpton, uh, Plymouth County, Massachusetts, as more particularly described and deed recorded with the Plymouth County Register of Deeds at Book 42557, page 105, uh, the property. The property is owned by Sarah E. Preston, trustee of the Atwood Family Irrevocable Trust, the owner. Um, the Board of Selectmen will consider whether the town will exercise the town's right of first refusal pursuant to General Law Chapter 61A, Article 14, to purchase the property um, and appropriate the funds necessary to acquire the property. The notice of intent to sell and accompanying documents submitted to the town by the owner may be reviewed at the town's clerk office located at the townhouse during business hours. Any person interested or wishing to be heard on on the matter may appear at the public hearing at the time and um, and the place designated above. Um, so that appeared in the Plumpton Halifax expressed on June 22nd and June 29. Um, a few ground rules for public hearings. Um, only one person is permitted to speak at a time. All discussion should go through the chair or go through the selectmen in general. All parties will be expected to conduct themselves civilly. Arguments between parties will not be tolerated. The proceedings, um, I'll leave that out. All right, so um, a little bit of background on how we got here. Um, Chapter 61A is a provision of the Mass General Law designed to encourage the preservation of the Commonwealth's va valuable farmland. It offers significant local tax benefit to property owners willing to make a long-term commitment to farming. In exchange for those benefits, the city or town in which the land is located is given the right of first refusal if the property, um, if the use of the property is changed or if the property is sold. Um, it takes a bona fide purchase and sale agreement without conditions um, uh, uh, between the owner and a potential, uh, uh, potential buyer to trigger this right of first refusal. Um, and in fact, we have received um, a bona f what is perceived as a bona fide purchase and sale agreement um, back on uh, March 10th or April 10th, I think, which has triggered the 120-day right of first refusal. Put more simply, the Board of Selectmen have a tw 120 days after that to decide whether we want to exercise that right. So what's happened since that bona fide offer? Uh, there have been uh, quite a bit of explorations on the advisability of exercising that option by various boards, committees, um, and knowledgeable in individuals. There have been a couple site tours, an appraisal has been done, there's been a hydrologic analysis, that is a water analysis. We've consulted with attorneys and we've consulted extensively with town council. Which brings us to tonight, a public hearing is an um, integral part of something necessary within the 120 days, um, and here we are. 
where this would go from here. Um, if the Board of Selectmen triggered their right of first refusal, uh, the next step would be to schedule an executive session uh, to craft a, a purchase and sale agreement, agree on that, a new purchase and sale agreement, and then have it recorded. At that point, we then end up with 90-day window to deal with funding, to have a special town meeting, and to close. Um, along the way, title work to be done, community preservation committee, if those funds were used, would have to go through its application process. A bunch of funding and bonding options would have to be explored. We'd uh, have to craft the, the articles for a special town meeting, have the special town meeting go, go to closing. Um, Really, the, the punchline in mentioning all that is the purpose of this public hearing tonight is explicitly for the Board of Selectmen to collect information, collect comments and opinions, um, and expert advice on whether to exercise our right of first refusal. Um, not everything in a purchase um, will is sorted out at this point or needs to be sorted out at this point. If the Board of Selectmen exercise their right of first refusal, then all that in addition work will have to be done along the way. Um, so, um, as far as the public hearing goes, um, there are um, a, a major part of the meeting is evidence um, gathering, um, and then after we've done that, there'll be deliberation amongst the selectmen, um, and then at the evening, the potential for a, a vote by the selectmen tonight. Um, in terms of evidence gathering, really three pieces to that. We're going to start with a co-chair of the Open Space Committee, um, Linda Letty, will give a very brief uh, presentation. She will introduce, introduce a couple of expert guests. Um, at that point, we'll have questions, but questions specifically for those experts um, so that they'll be able to leave after that. So that's part one. Part two is then we'll entertain questions and comments by anyone or everyone in favor of um, uh, this project. And then part three, uh, we'll um, uh, accept comments and questions from people that are opposed to the project. We'll then go into deliberation and then we'll see if we're going to have a vote or not. Um, last couple of things for me. All questions should go through the board. Um, when we get to the point of questions or comments, um, uh, we're asking people to limit themselves to two minutes for any of those. Um, we want everyone that wants to speak, both for and against, to have a chance to be heard. Um, serious and important decision to be made, but um, we um, really Really, really encourage people to um, make their um, points um, concise and keep it within two minutes. So that was one huge long sentence with barely a pause. Um, everyone okay with all of that? Okay with ground rules? Okay with the setup? All right. So um, with that, uh, I think I'll turn it over to Linda Letty. Hi, Linda. Before we start, there are people standing in the hall. Do we have other chairs that yeah, yeah. Other chairs come in? Come in and squeeze. It's going to be a long evening. Or not. <laughs> okay. Strong. Um, anyhow, thank you all for coming out. Um, Mark outlined the process that we're just beginning tonight. It's, um, it's hopefully we'll start it tonight, but it's a long one that is going to have many steps along the way that the public will stay both informed and have a chance to comment again and ask questions. So if you don't catch everything the first time around tonight, there'll be many opportunities to come back and talk about it again. But what we wanted to do tonight was to really focus on giving some core information that we found very important to look at in the last couple of months, we being the Open Space Committee. Uh, the Open Space Committee a couple years ago at the town meeting was voted something called a pre-acquisition grant, which in the town meeting's wisdom has turned out to be a wonderful thing to do. Um, this gave the um, Open Space Committee about $30,000 in case an important project came up for open space that we needed to pay some people to give us expert advice. We sat on it for like two years because nothing came along that we thought met that criteria. And then this thing came along in April, and we thought, whoa, that looks like something we need to know about. And as we looked at it, we realized we needed an expert help. So you're going to hear from some of those experts tonight. But to get us all oriented, uh, I thought we'd do a quick tour of the property. Because most of us haven't been out there. It's been you know, in private hands, after all. So most of us don't know what it looks like. 
So it's 113 acres, and if the magic of whatever it is. I don't want anybody disparaging my projector, by the way. <laughs> or the operator. Yeah. <laughs> Never. Well, keep talking. Well, I'm going to I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a tour of the property. <laughs> well, here's a beautiful big tree, and then there's a stream. It was working a minute ago. But let me go ahead, and we will loop back, because we have a chance to do the, the tour whenever that happens. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Mark mentioned that the purchase and sale agreement was signed uh, in early April. So the uh, Open Space Committee's first job was to read that, get familiar with the property as much as we could, and find out about it. And we realized, first of all, that we needed to gather a lot of information about the property. And, and to learn about these procedures and timelines that are imposed by the law because we, they're very strict. We have to make sure we don't um, make a mistake on them. And our main uh, goal was to evaluate if the property would become worthy of the uh, Board of Selectmen's and the town's consideration. We had no idea at that point. Well, we did have some idea, and I'll tell you why. But we had an idea, but we had to really verify. So um, we had become somewhat familiar with this part this part of town and this property because in the last year and a half we had to update the town's open space plan which has to be done every seven years and that requires that you draw on all the state and federal resources of information that can tell you okay so keep that thought there <laughs> now we're going to start walking and this is not in any sort of logical order but I thought I'd tell you this is a picture of you know one of the, the little dirt park roads that's the cranberry bog to the left. It's 15.6 acres. And Linda, one, one minute. we have four seats up front if anybody wants to use them. So you, you can see the presentation. Abe, can you move over a little? Chairs over here, too. Okay. So just as, as the slides go by, I'll just tell you the 113 acres consist of both the bog a reservoir that's called West Pond of 20 acres. There are front acres of uh, mixed deciduous and uh, evergreen woodland of 8 acres. There's upland mixed deciduous and evergreen forest of 20 acres that's on a hill. There's another wooded wetland acres of 49 acres that also has an elevation of a hill. And there are the two hills uh, are 66 feet and 79 feet high. We'll try to show that. Amy, if you can just keep on sort of rolling through them oh, yeah. now. <coughs> yeah. um, and then the, the Whetstone Brook forms the border on the western side, and the Sawmill Brook forms the border on the um, north. So uh, I've seen just a, a bit of it. I haven't been able to walk the whole thing either. But it's strikingly beautiful when you're out there. It is a stunning piece of, uh, you know, a mixture of wetlands and woods. There's one of the hills. You just can't capture the hill very well on a, uh, on a slide. but. Um, and there's a lot of elevation, and there's a lot of variety of habitat, and so it is a very special place. And as I started to say, when the Open Space Committee, all right, we, that's our last for that one. When the Open Space Committee had to update our plan a year and a half ago, we're required to check out all the state and federal resources of information to make sure that we know the latest data. So we have become aware of this particular part of town uh, through that process, and we were both pleased and amazed to learn that this part of town, the western part of Plimpton, is considered by the state agencies who evaluate natural habitats one of the healthiest and most environmentally intact and sound places in the state. Um, and that is because we have, um, and that's just not this 113 acres, but embedded in thousands of, of acres around it in both Plimpton and, and Middleborough. Um, and in fact, the parcel is listed among the top 20% in the state for its overall environmental health, among the top three in southeastern mass, and for both reasons, it's because it's maintaining its dynamic ecological processes, including especially its hydrologic regimes and its healthy aquatic systems. So this is something that caught our attention. 
um, because we were looking for the most valuable places in Plimpton to identify in the open space plan. And this one, this one came up just because of all those reasons very quickly. Um, we also knew something else about this property that probably many of you do, which is that going back to the 70s and 80s, there were problems with water contamination out there in the drinking wells. And so if you've lived in town a while, you've heard about that too. And so we were very aware that we'd have to learn more about that, that issue. Um, and that was from uh, leaks from the two landfills that were nearby. So we knew right away that we'd have to get something, some information on that. So to help us get started on gathering data, as Mark mentioned, we hired a very experienced appraisal company that's worked in this area for a long time to give us all the basic financial and profile data for the area. Uh, we hired Peter Newton, who you're about to meet, a hydrogeologist, very experienced in studying these kinds of issues and contamination uh, issues in wetlands and uh, groundwater. And we were concerned about hearing his, his analysis, so you're about to hear the, the highlights of that. And lastly, we hired Eric Wahlberg, who's an environmental planner, to look at all the aspects of, to better understand the environmental assets of what we just learned about. And he's been a leader in the Taunton River watershed project over the past several years. Peter is with uh, Bristol Engineering, which is a consulting company, and that's why they have wide experience. Uh, Eric is with Manimit, which is a, a scientifically based organization that works to create sustainable economic and environmental systems with the public and private sector, and it works throughout the Americas. But uh, Eric's been working particularly around here, so he knows this area very, very well. So these are the two people you're about to meet. They really know their stuff. And we don't have a chance to give them more than a few minutes, 10 minutes or so each tonight. We hope to have them back sometime so we can all learn more from them. And so uh, keep track of what you want to hear more of and we'll try to accommodate you in the future. But first, we're going to get started with Peter. And Peter, we do have that next thing Amy to push for you and get them back. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, so my name is Peter Newton. I'm a, uh, a hydrogeologist with Bristol Engineering Advisors out of Mattapoisa. Um, just uh, a lot of people hear the word hydrogeologist and I, I trip over it, but a hydrogeologist basically studies the movement of water in the ground. So um, once it, you know, if it rains, the water, the, what doesn't run off into the brooks, infiltrates into the ground. And then when it gets there, Voodoo happens and it comes out in the well, or it emerges in a in a brook. And my job is to understand that voodoo a little bit. Uh, so, um, when I was approached from the open space by the open space committee to take a look at this site um, to, to try to understand what might have been the fate of some of the groundwater contamination that is known from the Raven Brook and the Middleborough landfill, um, I the first thing I did was uh, pull up some maps and look into. Um, an online uh, mapping that the state Com the Department of Environmental Protection has uh, to try to understand how things tied together. Um, the other thing, the other uh, resource we use extensively is mapping done by the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, they have mapped this area extensively over the years, um, and uh, and so that was a, a, a vital component of my review. Um, the. Uh, the other thing I did was uh, knowing that the, the Middleborough landfill and Ravenbrook landfill were active or were sites in DEP uh, parlance. There's a great deal of records on file uh, with the, at the Lake off, DEP office in Lakeville. Um, and uh, so you know, that was another component of the review was to go and, and evaluate as much of that historical data as, uh, as, I, could, as I could within the time frame that we have. So the gist of it is you see the, uh, the Atwood property, and, and I think, I guess it bears mentioning, uh, Mark, that um, really what I was tasked with was looking at what is the potential that, that um, groundwater deep below the Atwood parcel would be, uh, would be likely to be potable, drink that is of drinking water quality, or at least um, how, uh, whether it would be impacted from landfill activities. Uh, I'm, ca I'm couching my words, and I'll, I can explain that in a little bit. But um, uh, So in the top left corner, the Atwood property lots, there's, a, there's an area that, uh, that, that, that we're interested in. Geographically, it kind of matters where that is. Um, uh, and then as we go clockwise, there's uh, a site that 
I really, we really couldn't find any information on with Mass Environmental Systems at Carver that was a, a groundwater discharge um, of some uh, of some unknown duration and and where it, what the what it was discharging. We're not sure, but but again, um, I'm not sure that that's terribly important. Uh, I mentioned Stone Cranberry property. The Stone Cranberry property is listed as a site, but all the data suggests that Stone Cranberry, their issues were related from people upstream of them. Uh, one is aggregate industries, which is a uh, gravel uh, operation and also a asphalt plant. Uh, and they have had some releases to the environment um, dating back into the 80s primarily. Ravenbrook Landfill, which is probably the most severe um, site that I reviewed, and then the Middleborough Landfill. Now, the Ravenbrook Landfill is about a mile or so uh, up gradient, so uh, south, but groundwater in this area is flowing from the southeast towards the northwest along the Whetstone Brook uh, uh, drainage channel, loosely in that channel. Um, it's covered both by surficial topography and the nature of uh, the, the, how the bedrock is shaped deep down, uh, about 80 to 100 feet below, below their, the feet, below the ground there. Um, <clears throat> great deal of review of the, of, uh, the files in, about, on the Ravenbrook landfill. Um, there was uh, groundwater contamination. It was studied. It was, they remediated. They, they uh, undertook a, several different uh, technologies to remediate uh, contamination there. And it's um, mostly been mitigated, essentially been mitigated from offsite. And the middle of our field. Um, some of you are aware that a couple of wells um, were contaminated. Uh, Middleborough brought public water to a couple homes uh, in that in, in Middleborough, but also a couple homes in Plimpton, right in that at the intersection there. Um, and uh, I'll explain to you why I think that is not a major concern uh, for uh, the other process. So geologically speaking, this whole area um, it was all the sediment, all the the dirt that we walk on was laid down between 15 and 8,000 years ago uh, by glaciers, as just primarily as they retreated. Now, there's two different kinds of deposits. There's what we call glacial outwash, which is the stuff that the, when the glaciers melt, they transport soil, sediment and soils. I mean, when it rains and you see uh, muddy color in a brook, or that's sediment that's getting washed out. The same thing happens when a glacier melts and it transports sediment down, and that sediment stratifies based on the vo velocity of the water. Fast water carries big particles, slow water carries sm uh, fine particles, uh, and the sort of bigger particles have settled out. That kind of makes intuitive sense. Um, the other kind is what we call basal, basal, basal till, B-A-S-A-L. So at the bottom, and that is, uh, is, is deposits that have been basically bulldozed and milled over underneath the glacier as the glacier advanced. That stuff is very hard, it's uh, very dense, it's made up of clays and boulders and sands and gravels and cobbles, and water does not trans uh, transmit through that basal till well at all. Um, so what we have a kind of a an interesting envi geologic environment here. We've got all the bedrock essentially is from everything that I've reviewed is underlain by basal till here. That's very common in New England, especially in this part of New England. Um, so we have bedrock which might have fractures. I think everyone here who has a private well, I would guarantee, or I would, at least 99% of you have a well that's drilled into rock. Very few public uh, homeowner wells are installed in, in the, the soils above it. They're expensive to build. Uh, and they're technically a little more challenging. Most well drillers will drill right through all that stuff, drive a casing into rock, and then continue to drill into rock until they get fractures that yield water. Most bedrock wells, residential wells, five to 10 gallons per minute. It's fairly common. Some people get lucky and they get 50. But that's, that's, uh, that's not all that common. So as the glacier retreated, there's evidence that the water velocity from the melt, the melt water velocity went from slower to faster as, it, as these deposits were, were, uh, were laid down. So we have 60, 70, 80 feet of, of deposits that are all, were all transported here from north here and washed out by the glaciers. Now the reason we say there's evidence of that is the stuff down deep is fine, doesn't transmit water very well. As we get higher in the aquifer, 
that material gets more coarse until we get fairly coarse stuff on the top that transmits water very well. Why is that relevant to us? Because the Ravenbrook landfill and the Middleboro landfill, the, uh, the contamination that was discovered was discovered in the permeable shallower deposits. And they, uh, in all the drilling work, or most of the, you know, essentially all the drilling that they did deep into the less permeable stuff uh, was substantially free of contamination. So what that meant is as rainwater rained on these, you know, rained on these landfills and percolated and picked up the contamination and went into the, percolated down to the water table, it ran across through the permeable stuff on top of the less permeable stuff. So it didn't get very deep, okay? Um, the, I mentioned the residential wells in the, at the Middleborough, Plinthy Carver uh, corner there that were, uh, uh, that were impacted. Those wells were at shallow driven well points, 30 feet, uh, I don't know if they're hand driven, but you know, driven well points into the overburden material. Nobody builds wells like that for homes anymore. Um, those wells are highly susceptible to contamination. Um, I forget the name of the, the development to the just immediately to the east of the box across uh, um, Toby Lane. Yeah. So I looked at uh, I, I acquired a, a drillers logs from several of the wells along Toby Lane. Much more typical. Those were built in the, in the mid, -80s, mid to late 80s, early 90s. Those wells were all cased through the overburden, through the soils, into bedrock, and drilled into rock. We have no evidence from any of the landfill studies uh, or the aggregate industry studies or, um, that, that contamination ever made it into the rock because of the nature of the geology here. Because the, the shallow deposits are so much more permeable, so much coarser uh, than the deeper deposits. It just took the water groundwater takes the path of least resistance and flew, flew in the shallow. So for those reasons, it's, it's my considered opinion that, uh, that a properly constructed and installed well uh, you know, in the Atwood parcel is, is very likely to be unimpacted by the landfill or, or human activities. I, I, Couch that because, as everybody knows, there's a lot of iron in the water around here. There's manganese in the water, and sodium is starting to show signs of increasing because we salt the crap out of our out of our roads, and um, and you know it's a public safety issue, and you know no one's come up with a suitable economic alternative to sodium. So you might find that stuff in there, and that might turn somebody off. But from all of our, you know, our, in our professional perspective, that doesn't make a well unpotable. So, so there could be naturally occurring compounds in there that make the well less than desirable. But in terms of impacts from the landfills or from other ac industrial activities in the area, um, I think it's reasonable, reasonably um, sure that uh, there will be no, you know, no contamination. Great. Isn't it Thanks. nice? Do you want to ask a question? Don't you? <laughs> do you want questions first or do you want no, Eric? No, no, no. We're going to do questions after Eric. Okay, oh, good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I, Peter, Peter has some real time challenges. No, I, I and, don't, and I we, don't. We, okay. We're not leaving till Wednesday now. All, so. all right. Well, then we might keep you all night. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. But that was a great geology review, too. Wasn't it? <laughs> I didn't think I liked geology. <laughs> So next is Eric Wahlberg, and he's from Manamit. He's been uh, uh, working on the Taunton Watershed uh, project down here for the last several years. And he's been an environmental planner on this one stuff for many years.
See how plugged in and everything. He had it working fine when we came in. Oh yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Oh, just um, swapping the computer out of there. Here comes. Here comes. Oh, waking up. I guess these things are just all very slow. Okay. It's starting to come on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Wahlberg. As Linda said, um, with Manomet, um, our headquarters are here in Plymouth, Massachusetts, so we're local, if you will. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of different aspects of, of work that I've been doing in the region. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of slides that look at the Taunton watershed in its entirety, and the reason is that Plimpton is located in the very eastern portion of that watershed. So we're going to start off with kind of a big picture view and then we're going to bring it down to the site that's in question and I'm going to walk you through some of the environmental attributes there. So. All right, so um, I've been working for a number of years now with a group called the Resilient Taunton Watershed Network and this includes federal agencies, EPA, um, includes a number of state agencies, um, regional planning agencies and localities, and then a number of different nonprofits. That includes Manomet, uh, Mass Audubon, the Nature Conservancy, etc. So we've got um, you know quite a, a group um, working together. And the reason that we're focused on the Taunton watershed is because if you look at, at Massachusetts on the whole, um, we've got some of the best sort of intact natural resources left anywhere in the state, right here in our backyard and in, in the Taunton watershed. Um, now, admittedly, you know, some of the western part of the state is very rural, but for, you know, the relatively urban eastern part of the state, this is really a treasure. And this is why this big consortium of people have been working for a lot of years on conservation issues here. Um, so, um, almost all the maps I'm going to show you tonight are from what's called a green infrastructure analysis that, that Manaman did. And, and the whole approach with green infrastructure is looking at natural systems um, from an analytic perspective and thinking about what valuable services they provide to man. And this includes protecting water quality, flood protection, biodiversity support, etc. And so there are a number of different inputs that went into this analysis. What's shown in green here are the areas of, of high ecological value. And as we walk through this, I'll explain the various inputs and, and those attributes. Um, just for the sake of orientation here, um, this is Plimpton right here. Um, this outline is, is all of the Taunton watershed. Um, this is one of the three main tributary watersheds to Narragansett Bay. This is over a 500 square mile area. Um, so you can get an idea from the density of the green here that there is really a lot of intact forest here, a lot of intact wetlands, and it really is a treasure. Now development pressure is starting to ramp up in this part of the world, and so um, Plimpton's been lucky so far. You know, my understanding is the development pressure really hadn't started to bite here. But if you look at a lot of the surrounding communities, that's not the case, and I think there's every reason to expect over time that that development pressure is going to start to ramp up here. Okay, this next slide, what we've done is we've backed out all of the protected land. Everything that's in conservation status has been taken off the map. So that leaves us with about 66% of this high-value natural area that's both undeveloped and unprotected. So that is what we consider to be in play. This is land that could be developed, could be turned into other uses. So for our conservation planning work, this is really the area that we're targeted on. Okay, so now we're gonna change things up and, and look at the site. Um, you know, I think most people are probably familiar with this, but you know, this, this red area is the parcel boundary. Um, on each of these maps, there's gonna be an inset that'll show all of Plimpton, and you'll see down here, we, we've got the site shown in that little red polygon. So as we go through these, you'll be able to not only see, you know, what the context is around the site, but you'll also be able to see the Plimpton-wide context as we go through this. Okay, so the, the, we've got three main inputs that went into our green infrastructure analysis. Uh, the first is the Biomap 2 work, and this was done for the entire state of Massachusetts, um, uh, a consortium of scientists worked together for several years. There have been two iterations since the name Biomap 2 here. And it really does a great job of identifying those lands that are really important for biodiversity support. And in particular, it focuses on rare, threatened, and endangered species. Um, there's sort of two components to the Biomap 2 analysis. Um, one is the Biomap core areas. That's what's shown in the crosshatch here. 
then you'll see a solid green area that just extends beyond the edges. That's called critical natural landscape. Those are the areas that are important to support the area shown in Hatch where the rare threatened and endangered species habitat is. Now if you look down at the inset map, um, as I've discussed, you can see in Plimpton writ large, there's sort of two of these big core areas, one here and then one down in this area that extends into the adjacent localities. And so you can see that the site, the um, Atwood site, is, is in that, that second of those two areas. Uh, this just gives you an idea of, of what type of um, habitat and what type of bird species that are, are rare, threatened, and endangered in this area. Um, up on the upper left is the American bittern, um, upland sandpiper on the lower left, and one of my favorites, the pied-bill grebe. And I think everybody can agree having neighbors like this really boosts the value of your community, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the second of the two inputs <clears throat> into our green infrastructure analysis um, this was uh, work that was done by the Nature Conservancy basically for the whole northeastern U.S. and they called it their resilient landscapes analysis. Um, the Biomap 2 work really is focused on sort of the resources we have on the ground now. Uh, this resilient landscapes work is forward looking if you will and it takes climate change into account and it's an effort, um, we don't really know exactly how ecosystems are going to reorganize as the climate warms and, and moisture availability changes but there's a lot of evidence that areas of high geophysical diversity, areas with good connectivity across the landscape are likely to support high, bi high biodiversity as the climate warms. And the way this reads is that the, the darker green colors, um, such as this, are the highest end of the scale for value, um, and then the brown areas are at the low end of the scale. So you can see um, we've got some variation within the site, but much of it's in the green, indicating that this is uh, an area that's anticipated to support high biodiversity as the climate warms. And then again, you can look down at the inset map, and you can see that within Plimpton, you know, there are a couple of different large green areas. And again, the site is in one of those larger green areas, indicating the ecological value. All right, and then the third input that we used, you know, so far we've been talking largely about biodiversity support and habitat value, but we also wanted to really think about water supply issues, thinking about um, protection from non-point source water pollution, thinking about flood uh, protection as well. So the way that this map reads, and it's a little bit busy, but I'll walk you through it. Um, the purple color here, these are all freshwater wetlands. Um, the blue color, um, this is surface water and this is the pond associated with cranberry bogs on the site. Uh, the red areas are the 100 year flood, FEMA flood areas. So those are areas that are a little bit lower on the landscape, more vulnerable to flooding. And then the green is what we're calling our riparian buffer network. It's, it's actually a little bit more extensive than that because it does buffer the wetlands as well. Um, so that starts to give you an idea of, of what some of the high value hydrologic features are on the surface and then this buffer system around it that if you know, we avoid development in that buffer system, it helps to protect those resources. Right, this next slide just backs out um, a number of the different features so that the, um, the riparian buffer network pops out. It's a little bit easier to read. And again, you can see that this is a site that's got a lot of high value resource from that perspective. All right, and then finally, um, you know, we combine all three of those inputs, and this is our aggregate green infrastructure network. And at the beginning, I showed you that for the entire Taunton watershed. Um, but you can see here, as far as the site's concerned, um, basically it's all within the green infrastructure network indicating high value. And then Plimpton, again, this is roughly the, the cutoff for the Taunton watershed, so everything out to the west here is in, in the Taunton. So you can see this is, is one of the, the sort of major um, undeveloped and unprotected components in the green infrastructure network for the, the Taunton watershed writ large. And so you, you, you guys have really got an opportunity here. And I guess that, that's really the thought I'd like to leave you with, is that you know, by the time um, some of the more development, developed communities in the watershed uh, reach the point of having this discussion, oftentimes they're, they're already really hemmed in with development. And, and so you, know, you guys are in an area, one of the few areas within the Taunton watershed that really hadn't face that development pressure in a big way yet. So you've got an opportunity to get out and find. So I think it's just great that you're having this conversation and i um, be happy to help you out with any of the information I can bring or a larger um, Resilient Taunton Watershed Network can bring. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Now's the time for, for questions. For <coughs> yeah, so um, our two experts will be offered the chance to leave after, if there are <laughs> made, uh, um, and particularly if the Board of Selectmen, who are the ones that are stuck with, I mean blessed with, uh, making a decision along the way, and if you have any questions for our expert guests. Not off the top of my head. It was very well done. Thank you. Thanks, I've got a couple questions. Is the property included in a groundwater protection district? Do we know? It's, there's a limited groundwater protection district at the north end of the property. It's something that we as a town need to look at expanding. It's up to the towns to take the initiative to work with DEP and the town meeting to expand our groundwater protection districts. And it's one of those things that, you know, the people slogan things on sometimes. Okay. So probably next town meeting, the big town meeting, you'll see us. But it's at the northern end. Great, thank you. Is, um, would it be possible for this property to be considered a public water supply in the event of something catastrophic? That's a question for me, I assume. Yes, Peter. <laughs> is it possible? Is it possible? Uh, so the honest answer is, is it could be, but I don't know because no one's tested it. Um, a public water supply, typically you're looking at something on the order of 100,000 gallons a day or more, so 70 gallons a minute or more. My, my gut is the site could probably provide, in the, in the shallower, in the sands and gravels, you could probably get 70 gallons a minute um, out, of a, out of a well or network of wells. So it's conceivable, but no one's tested it, so we don't know. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any major sort of big topic questions uh, before we move on beyond the experts? Howard. In terms of, I don't know what the long-term plan is in, in, the, in the bogs that were on the property, but obviously you haven't had a chance to, to look at what practices were used in cultivating those bogs. Uh, are they consistent with the wells? Um, so, I mean, you know, you're, you understand the prevalence of bogs in this part of the, this part of the world. I mean, they're everywhere. Uh, they, uh, everyone, every community down here relies on groundwater, uh, primarily. So, there has been a fair amount of co-location of, of public drinking water supply wells and cranberry bogs. Um, there's been some effort to understand the impacts that bog activities may have on public water supply wells. Um, the results from everything I've read is somewhat inconclusive. Um, it's known that bog, that bog operators use um, pesticides uh, and other uh, and fertilizers on the, on the bogs. Uh, the cranberry station, uh, UMass cranberry station, where I am, or Carver, or somewhere, um, has been studying that. Uh, and at, as of the last time I was involved in looking at something like this, it was uh, there was no definitive adverse effect. There are daughter products, so when a chemical is applied, the environment, bacteria in the environment, the sunlight tends to break down these these chemicals into different. And they call those daughter. There's a parent product and a daughter product. Um, some of those daughter products have been have been detected in where I am fire district, for example, a couple of their wells. Um, there is the levels they've been detected at are very low, uh, and um, there it's not possible to really state whether there's a health impact because no one's there's I think a million new chemicals every year that are being created, and, and we just don't have the data on all of them. So. Um, so we don't know, but but the understanding, you know, the expectation is based on what people do know about these chemicals and the levels that they're being detected at, uh, that um, they don't foresee any uh, harm. One more big picture question. We're good. Guys, thank you thank very, you. very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Great, great information. So I think we have a few more comments from Linda and then we'll move to the questions um, 
uh, comments and in favor of the project from uh, the general public. Yeah, I just want to close real quick and say that you remember I was talking about the open space plan in 2016 and we did um, have a resident survey to ask people, we do this every seven years, to ask people to rank what their most important priorities are for the next seven years. And we've done this since the late 80s. And for the last 20 years, the result of the, that survey has been the number one priority has been keep Plimpton rural. And that was a close number two this year, first time in since however many years, since 1987. Number one this year was protect our water. Protect our water, protect our water resources, protect our um, capacity, you know, both quantity and quality. And that was noticeable, you know. So, um, so we still want to keep the town rural, but people are very conscious that uh, we are water dependent and they want to make sure that we're paying attention to that as a priority of the town. So that was the first thing that, that changed a little bit. Um, and so secondly, as a result of the studies you've heard tonight and the other things that we've looked at and other people we've talked to, the Open Space Committee um, has been doing this, um, working closely on this along with a working group. We call it the Prospect Street Working Group and that's a group of representative people from a lot of the committees in town so that we get inputs not just from Open Space but from all the other committees that are involved as well. And so we did meet again last week and we uh, took a vote on what to recommend to you and we are strongly recommending and hope that you will go ahead and authorize and ex execute the right of first refusal tonight as a first step towards thinking about acquiring the property and seeing what the, that could lead to. And um, on a practical end, we thought you might want to know about how we'd pay for it. Um, and remember we have to, uh, I don't know if Mark explained this, but when you come into a right of first refusal process, it's not like going to uh, a seller on your own or having them advertise their own. Um, we're stepping into and taking over another buyer's purchase and sale and how they created it with the seller. So we're sort of, you know, stepping into their place just the way it was constructed with some minor things that, you know, we can, we can change. But so basically we, we have the 800,000 price, by the way, was well within the appraisal estimate. So it's a very legitimate price. Um, but we have to figure out a way to pay for it. So I'll let you guys pass some of these. Um, and so while they're doing that, um, what we, what we did is we've come up with an illustration of a way that includes both some basic principles that we think should be followed by the town uh, in terms of financing it, as well as some example of how those principles could be applied. So for $800,000, the Open Space Committee proposes that the fund should be secured through a combination of three strategies. And uh, these strategies are first, through a public procurement process that the selectmen would run after our town meeting in the fall, that we would sell not more than three parcels of land for individual housing lots on a total of four and a half acres fronting Prospect Street, and the estimated value of each lot and a half is 145,000 for a total of 435,000. A municipal or short-term a municipal bond or short-term borrowing can secure the town's ownership of these parcels while the procurement process is underway. So the first thing is we take a short-term loan, we buy it, we write the procurement for the specifications we want to have protecting or incorporate into the property, and we sell free housing loans. Number two, through private donations. We are going to try to secure at least $65,000 uh, that is donated to the town of Plimpton for the, per for the purchase of, pr of purchasing this property. And these funds will be used to set aside land at the front of the property for public access between the housing lots and the back area and will be designated as conservation land because otherwise there's no connection between the front and the back. You can't get from here to there. <coughs> so that would be, and that's through private donations. With, uh, those of you who were around five or six years ago, we had a parks project and you might remember that we had to raise money there too. We had, we had some money, but we didn't have a lot of money and so we had to raise from individuals uh, money and we raised over $54,000 at that point and uh, had things that you know, made it possible to get that done. So this is the same spirit. You know, we're not necessarily selling planks tonight. Keep that in mind, it may happen in the future. But it's the same spirit, is that Plimpton doesn't have a lot of money. If we want to do things here in town, we all have to contribute if we really want it, and so think about that. Number three is uh, community preservation funding. 
Uh, that has uh, community preservation uh, covers several different areas under its uh, statute, and one of them is open space. So we are proposing 300,000 would be uh, taken from conservation funding, whether through bonding or from existing <coughs> funds or however it works, uh, for the remaining 103 acres in the back. The, uh, the front parcel and the, um, the front parcel would be four and a half acres for the housing. The public uh, access area is about five and a half acres, and then there's 103 acres in back. So it's about 109, 108 and a half acres would be bought for um, all these things together, particularly the 300,000 in the back is CPA funding. So the individual components of this may vary, but the, the spirit of putting three kinds of things together to make all this work is what we're going to be looking at. Um, and the, this is uh, really what we, the open space believes is the most effective way to purchase the property, to have the mixed sources of income. We believe this, will, this particular area will have invaluable benefits to the town, both ecologically, economically, and uh, in terms of uh, the quality of life here in the town. And we also think it respects the need to prudently manage the competing demands on Plimpton's financial resources. If we didn't have constraints, if we had a lot more money, wouldn't that be nice? But life, it doesn't seem to be like that, and certainly it isn't for Plimpton, so we think this, is, this proposal is what we think is a practical way to try to get the 800,000 accomplished. So that's the start for that, and if you have any questions about that, we'd be glad to take that. All right, so just to, thank you, Linda. Um, just to remind everyone, we're in the um, evidence gathering part of the public hearing. Um, we'll um, uh, accept uh, comments and questions of those in favor, then those who aren't in favor, then we'll close that part and we will go into deliberation. Um, just a reminder, um, for people that want to make comments, please keep it to two minutes or less so everyone has a chance. We do want to hear from everyone and all the varied opinions that that there are in the room. And then just two more reminders. The question that the Board of Selectmen ultimately are needing to consider tonight is whether to exercise our right of first refusal. Um, there'll be a whole separate process um, and more information and in putting together um, a, a special town meeting. Um, we're not voting tonight on doing this project. We're voting tonight or when we vote on um, at least going forward. Um, ultimately, this thing would be approved or not approved by town meeting. Um, so, we're in a place where people in favor can ask questions. Um, we very much welcome comments. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Susan Vetterlein, my name is Janine Stray. I think it's a fabulous idea. Obviously, a well thought out presentation, and um, I hope that um, are favorable, <laughs> favorably inclined. Nicole Brown, 62 Prospect. Um, how do you sell three lots um, and take that money, and that goes towards basically a loan that we're taking out on this land? Is that mm -hmm. correct? Will those lots be built on before they're sold or after? Um, I know the answer, but I'm going to let well, Linda answer. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> um, no, the lots would be sold through um, uh, the sometimes convoluted com procurement process. Um, they would be sold with um, um, deed restrictions on them that they sort of befit the land and be a minimal impact. Um, no, but first is sell the land. What's that? Yeah. They, they can't do X, Y, or Z. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Also, yeah. just if I can butt in, because we were also concerned, we've talked to a couple of lawyers about how does the procurement process work? Is it always the lowest possible bidder, and you know, all that kind of yeah. stuff? And uh, different lawyers, so this is a good thing, have all said the same thing at a different, you know, different times, which is you can set your criteria. You can indicate some of the quality of the housing you want, how much habitat you want remaining, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you can try to have some quality control. Um, now, you know, we're working with just 10 acres, so I mean, you know, and we're going to have part of it for us. So don't imagine that it's going to look like Yellowstone Park. I mean, we still have some constraints out there. But, um, but it's not a free-for-all that we put out a request for proposals. We've got to take the lowest bidder. It's not that at all. Okay. Um, do we have say in who the builder will be, or is that just... Uh, probably not. I don't think so. Okay. But remember, it's an open bidding process, and they tell us. Again, the lawyers say, 
by the way you write the procurement process, people, bidders, builders sort of know if they're likely to have a chance by the way you indicate what you're looking for. Okay. So um, they sort of self-select. So, but other than that, I we, we I haven't been through it before. I don't think any of us have, but they're 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 assuring us that you could get pretty much at least you know the ballpark of what you want. Okay. So what is the town guesstimate on those ten acres? Is it four hundred and thirty thousand? Do you have a guesstimate on time, like how fast you think those will sell? So it's paid back to the town, so people aren't so afraid of oh my god, my taxes are going to go up. The appraiser, um, who's this guy who's who worked around here a lot, and knows the surrounding towns. And the appraisal said very cautiously he can't imagine it not selling within a year. Right. But functionally on the phone, he said things are moving very quick, yes. and it's really just going to be more up to us as soon as the town meeting votes this whenever it is in the fall. Right. Then we have to quickly put a procurement process together, which apparently the lawyers say is not a big deal. Um, yeah. And we get it out there. So um, right. if the real estate market stays hot, apparently uh, you know, there's, there's a sense that it will move fairly quickly. Well, the preservation funds, how much do we have available? Um, uh, for a project like this, a little over four hundred thousand so, dollars so in community so, preservation. So we have four hundred thousand dollars that's set aside for us for the town to purchase something like this. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we would hopefully get about four hundred thousand, four hundred fifty thousand dollars added to that to purchase the land. So mm -hmm. we're kind of coming up even. So the town won't be there won't be a ton of money taken from the town. Is that right? I think that would be a major concern with people. Who Taxes are going up, or they're going, or they have property value. I'm assuming if we have a beautiful property yeah. like that, it will be. Your, in, your property value is going to increase. In essence, if you this know. goes as expected, um, between private donations, between CPC money. Um, yeah, there would there would there would be um, no additional tax money that would have to go to this, uh, assuming we're able to sell the three lots. Um, the nice thing about the Community Preservation Act funds is anywhere between twenty and thirty percent of that money is actually state match, so it's even less of the town's money that's going into. Sir, Justin Shepard, Zinger Street, Street. Um, Zinger. in favor of this, and I think. I moved to Clinton because it's rural, because I like the open space that we have. Uh, most of that's private, I found out working with Linda. Um, so being able to make some of that public is certainly you know, something that, that I'm in favor of. Um, as far as the, the financing and how that's going to go, um, I do have some questions. If we are, we have $400,000 in CPC, what's the annual, annual tax revenue from CPC, which goes into that fund every year? Varies on the state match. Uh, figure these days, roughly ninety thousand per year. Okay. Not all of which are, it, they are designated for various um, little cubby holes, but uh, the majority of it could be used on a project like this. So in about five years, we could sell no house lots and still pay it off without it costing the taxpayers any money. I think the downside of that would be. Um, um, uh, tying up a, a great deal of CPC funds in one project um, when and, and um, probably limiting our possibility of, of doing other projects or you know the classic example being uh, um, uh, Churchill Park and Cato's Ridge I mean essentially we created a 125 acre park by buying a small 10 acre lot with CPC money to give us access to the whole thing and I think there is a sense um, um, by many who are looking at this that we want to keep our options open for other opportunities that uh, might come up that way and I, I think there'd be uh, certainly a fair amount of hesitancy to tie up so much CPC funds that our hands were tied for five years because in that time some other cool creative process projects going to come along. Absolutely so we can preserve say three quarters of that but 300,000 and keep for 100,000, and then that would be an extra year. Mm -hmm. So it would be six years instead of five. And, I, and you know, this is this is one of the many issues that we are going to have to continue to work on as we go through um, the next phase if the Board of Selectmen decides to go ahead. And I, I mean, we've been playing with this, and I, look, if we were super lucky in private donations, this is a little hint, 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 um, it would be all the less money that would have to be tied up. Um, Has there been a committee created to 
look at this and look at it specifically the financing side of it. Obviously, Linda's got the environmental side covered, but. We're, we're going to have the Open Space Committee is setting up the Finance Subcommittee. We okay. already have a couple of people on it. Susan Ossoff, who's our former finance chair, chairman here in town, is on it. Gavin is on it. Um, so, I'd love to be on it. Pardon? I'd love to be on it. Well, I think you just got on it. You just got on it. You just got on it. We mentioned it as a $100,000 donation per. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Really> you? <laughs> yeah. I'm in. <laughs> uh, but, you know, seriously, I think it's, we've struggled with something. There's been a conversation, sort of the way of something you've been bringing up, has been bringing up, been brought up for the last couple of months. And when we took our vote uh, in uh, the Open Space Committee last Wednesday night, uh, we talked about it again. This alternative idea has been, um, instead of buying 108 and a half acres for, say, 365,000, to buy the extra four and a half acres for the extra 435,000. So that's pretty steep. Um, you know, are those four and a half acres? Now I have to say, as an open space committee, and me personally, we don't really like building houses. This is not what an open space committee does, and we don't promote building houses. But uh, as Mark said, there are a couple of things that uh, we've looked preliminarily, you guys in the Finance Committee will look more. We look preliminarily at bonding rates even over 15 or 20 years. It would be a lot of money that would be tied up and would be taken out of the annual CPC take of 90,000, might be dropping to 30 or 40,000. Uh, CPC covers uh, historical preservation. It covers you know, recreation and school activities, it covers affordable housing, and there's a lot of other needs that have to be taken care of at a CPC. And, um, and as Mark said, if this hasn't come up as a project, we as an open space committee have just finished the plan, and the next thing we were going to do was to look at all the parcels around town of like 20 acres or more, and how they're vulnerable, you know, because people, that's people's assets, right? So you have to figure out how can we get ahead of the curve? and talk to people and say, look at that 50 acres here, look at that 20 acres, look at that 100 acres. Maybe there are ways we can work with those people to give them tax benefits, to buy easements from them, even to buy something from them, so that we don't get a surprise on the paper next Friday morning that something is happening. And um, to do that, we need money. So if we take $435,000 for four and a half acres, you have to ask, is that likely to tying up that money for four and a half acres now is really going to preclude probably a lot of our open space action from CPC for many years to come. Is that trade-off worth it? And also, we don't want to crowd necessarily by bonding the other initiatives within CPC. So it's been a tough decision. It's not easy. The discussion's still going on. But we can't see a way to do it and be fair, even though the town uh, you know, the town doesn't have the money, even though our heart is in open space. So it's a, this has been a killer, and still is, but that's the way we see it. Uh, Amy, and have, then. have you thought about um, taking pledges in advance so you can sort of see what people are willing to pledge? Because, yeah. I mean, $50 from a whole bunch of people goes a whole long way. Well, every 145000 buys a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. We're trying to... Um, if we have to raise 435000 to compensate for this, that's a lot of money. I mean, let's be realistic. <laughs> you know, so uh, what we'd like to do is the 65000 is what we need to put the public access in. You know, so that's, that's five and a half acres. Um, anything we can raise over and above that actually will also help us not take as much from CPC and let there be more for other initiatives because we'd have to raise a whole lot to compensate for those four and a half acres in front. Um, any of you know giant big angels who, um, and you know, there may be other some, some sources of large funds and we're looking. Um, and if life had been different, we would have been able to go over after some grant funds in the state and probably would have been very competitive, but we would have not been able to at this time of year and we couldn't have bought the property. So that was, the, you know, it's a bad luck in terms of how some of the big grants were. So for the moment, we, all money helps. We'll let you know the fund gets up. Every money counts. Every you know, but we have to look for big money to make this happen. I might just add to that. I, I think it's all right to say we have three informal pledges, really, without even begin, beginning the fundraising for $25,000. Yeah, we have um, 40 to go. We're already at 25000 um, um, And And I, this is, I, 
well, it's all right for me to say here. I, I, this model of the combination of town of, of donations and CPC money and other money, I think, is a beautiful model. It's sort of what we did at Cato's Ridge, and you know that was incredibly creative and successful and admired. And um, this one would be another one. And if we can follow that model, I think it's also a model for all the other projects. We are a town of um, modest means for sure, and so we have to do this a little creatively. Um, this land, I think, in most other towns, um, would be $3 million project. And, um, you know, I, we're doing it for, we're, we're seeing ways to do it for a whole bunch less. Um, AJ. Uh, so Jake Quinn, I'm at Four Soul Street. Uh, I have a, have a particular vested interest since this is literally my backyard, but uh, I know that maybe forward thinking there may be other plots of land in other parts of town that, um, you know, there's acreage out there, but I contend that there's nothing like this particular plot of land um, in Clinton. There's nothing comparable to this in Clinton. And I just kind of feel like this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, it's an incredible spot, and I just think it could be an amazing open space opportunity. So I hope that somehow uh, some combination of these different uh, options come together and that this starts along because it's, it's just an amazing property. And remember, the proposal that we've just given in Selectman is for 800,000 by 109 acres. So we're four acres short, okay, and it's painful four acres, but we're there for 109 acres. And when you saw what Eric put up here a few minutes ago, you saw, you know, Plimpton is one of the blobbiest greens towns in the state. We have so much left. There will be other needs. And as he says, if we don't keep them green, they're going to be different colors in 5, 10, 15 years, maybe so much sooner than that. So we need some capacity as a town to use CPC to get out there and, and again in smart, economically smart ways, you know, try to direct the, the future of the town. So and to see how quickly Carver has changed in ten yes. years. Yeah. It's, it's, that should be a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale. I mean, so so it's painful to give up. You know, for me, you know, the four and a half acres up front, I'm not going to be happy about it if we do that. But it's not going to be painful to know that those houses are paying their way. They're getting us 109 acres in the back, and they're going to help us get other acres around the town and to move quickly. We spend this money now, even if it's in a bond. We're going to watch these things come, and we're going to be broke. How are we going to stop things if we don't have money? We're not tax Sir. Um, Mike, from you, 158 Main Street. Now, first off, I just want to say thank you to everybody and uh, everybody on the Open Space Committee. And all the time you guys have put in the selectmen, this is a great great opportunity and it takes a lot of work and it takes everybody in the town to do it. Um, the other thing I do want to say to Linda's comments and to Mark's comments, even though money is always an issue for everybody, there's nobody here that's independently wealthy and you know it, it, money does not fall off trees. You can't recreate a piece of property like this as easily as you can raise eight hundred thousand dollars. So always think money is only money at the end of the day. And we have such a lovely little town here, and there are examples of towns like ours all over the country that are getting together and doing very unique things using technology, using finance, just using public support to get really creative how we do these things. And if we all think about that a little bit and what we can protect, we can essentially make the cost of doing a project like this evaporate into the value of what that actual land is. And I also have a degree in finance, and I will gladly volunteer. It's going to be a big committee. <laughs> <laughs> so please. You're on. And, and obviously, creative thinking, this new thinking that will cut the mustard and get it done is great. So. In the back. Mm -hmm. or, sorry, uh, Colleen's next. Uh, Kath, or, go ahead. I was going to ask the same. What's available in CPC funds for affordable housing? Um, about a hundred thousand. That may be a little off, but in that roughly in that range, we've been. I'm just I, CPC has been 
uh, the committee through all the years has been exquisitely is interested in housing and remains interested in sooner or later we'll have to spend the money the only way we can spend it is do it on housing it's just I <laughs> to some degree as difficult as complex these land sales are um, the housing thing is even more so um, it'll take something pretty creative and certainly will take a combination of grants and the like um, if there wasn't a time constraint just like missing out on this big grant that I think we would have won. If we didn't have a time constraint on us of you know, about 90 days, we could be creative in all kinds of ways, even in terms of funding. You know, there's, but we have this very short window where we lose this opportunity. And we have talked uh, by a wildlands trust with Habitat for Humanity and others. Of course, they want to build a house, but they want the town to buy the land. So you know, in the short term, we as a committee don't see a way to pull that complication off in addition to everything else for this particular parcel. But in the future, um, you know, we think it's ripe for opportunities to work together. But again, the, the constraints that are already on us, having talked a lot to lawyers even today, to keep this thing moving and to get to the finish line in the next 90 days is pretty intense. All right. Well, yeah. In my discussions with um, the nonprofits when we were doing the affordable housing plan, we would have to donate the land. That's the only way it would happen, and we would just have to do a deed restriction if we were to utilize those hundred thousand dollars as purchase of this property. And I don't know if that would well, is feasible or not. So, so if the houses are raising four thirty five, four hundred thirty five. Right. Yeah. So we'd be short forty-five thousand. Four hundred and thirty-five. Well, no. If we did one affordable housing oh, lot. Oh, one. I'm sorry. Yeah. One lot. This is why we can play. We can move numbers around. The next. This is a model. The one we threw out was a model. Mm -hmm. And people can, you know, we can start moving things around as long as we keep in mind that we have the, the trains moving. Okay. Susan. Yeah. Um, so, I, actually, I said Colleen next and then Susan. I would just mention in that about the moving around is the part of the process that would come next if the selectmen decide to exercise their right of first refusal is open space committee would uh, create a formal application to the community preservation committee and um, that's the phase when hopefully the uh, the community preservation committee works with the applicant to spiff up the project and make it even better so there'll be more vetting and um, a little bit of fluidity the numbers as, as things go along so I want to do this I, I want Colleen to have a chance and then Susan has changed her mind um, I have a suspicion that the selectmen have a bunch of questions I have a bunch of um, questions and maybe we should do that next I'm not forgetting that we have to have a opportunity for those to speak opposed but would that be all right Cause sure I, I know she only has about eight pages there it's so. just one and, like one and a half okay so Colleen um, and and then we'll go to Christy um, basically I just want to say that I'm, I'm really in favor of this I think you know life is about compromises and if we have to give up the four and a half acres and you know so be it. it it lets us gain so much more and and maybe with some of our young and innovative thinkers over here um, we won't have to give up those four and a half acres but, um, I think this is a project that that Clinton should embrace all right so to clarify we're not going to say we're not going to buy four and a half acres we're just saying that there's thinking that people don't want to sell any acreage they want this all to be conservation right we're buying the whole parcel including those four and a half acres it's okay to raise money towards the 800 perfect okay I just wanted to make sure it's perfectly clear so thank you very much all right so uh, there have been properties I've got a whole litany of questions and you may not be able to answer all of these Linda so there was recently a, a a parcel that was identified it was formerly owners unknown and it was assessed to the Atwood um, the Atwood Trust so how are we going to know that we're purchasing all of the property if there's parcels that are still being identified in the process um, if you guys vote tonight to go for the right of first refusal um, uh, we have talked to um, you know the KMP lawyer who's working with this uh, gentleman, Titan. And we would go out starting tomorrow and get a title company to work with us. Quite often in more traditional situations, you can wait till the end, and um, the seller just has to make sure that you know the, 
the buyer is getting what they think they are. They have a cap. This is a very, I guess this is a very sort of plain vanilla PNS that basically says they will, the seller is obligated to spend up to $1,000 to rectify the title. Um, the good news about that is that if we're putting the back into a lot of conservation lands, we don't care about a lot of these little blocks in the middle if it gets worked out about right. the oak tree and the maple tree from 1820, you know. But we do think it's wise, therefore, to go ahead and hire a title company sooner just to see that very question, to make sure that all the good work, uh, Wendy's been doing a lot of tracking it parallel in the assessor's right. office, but we're just going to go out and hire a title company tomorrow or the next day. Okay. Um, what's the status with the easement? Is an easement transferable if we were to purchase the property? Because I believe that there was talk of an easement by the Harlfinger's property. Oh, no, well, I'm not, I'm not even sure if we're in the same. Yeah. We're talking about um, having a public access path. Right. And that through, and, and, I, and an easement would be sought, uh, and that would uh, be on the name, some of the neighbor's property that we could just walk around on their property. They would still own the property. There mm -hmm. would just be a legal uh, section on their deed that said they let people walk back there. They still own the property. Okay, all right. I'm sorry, I have a question on that just before I forget. Mm -hmm. uh, that, if it is sold, that little easement, what happens? Does it, that well, transfer to the new? It doesn't get sold. It, it depends on how it works out. But if the owner wants to keep the easement, they keep the easement. They just have a little section in their deed that says, we let people walk through here. But if those people sell that property? Oh, it travels with the deed. It does. Okay. What if they want it? I don't know. We'd have to, that's what something we'd have to talk to the neighbor about as we do this. And we would be the owners who would request the easement then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we are looking at other ways also to get across the reservoir, you know, in terms of boardwalks and things. But, you know, it's good to have a land option. <laughs> right. Multiple accesses. Um, all right. Are the ocean spray delivery rights being maintained with the change of ownership in the event the town were to decide to do something with the bogs? It, they are Class A bogs. Mm -hmm. It's not clear from the PNS that the uh, rights are coming, the, the water rights, or anything like that. Okay. Our lawyer cannot give us their answer. Okay. What? Yeah, I can answer that. Oh, sure. My name is Sarah Preston. I'm the daughter of Beverly and Bruce Atwood, owner of the Bugs. Um, as far as ocean spray is concerned, it is a Class A bug. And if indeed you were going to still keep the cranberry bog going as a functional bog, and from what it sounds like, it's going to go to seed if the town takes it over. But if you were going to buy it, I've already been in touch with Ocean Spray and I have a contact there that I would get a hold of and there's another whole litany of paperwork that we need to do if it's going to be kept as a cranberry bog. If it's not going to be kept as a cranberry bog, I don't need right. to do anything. Okay. Okay. So Perfect. Let's pursue untangling all of that. Just see what happens. All right. My next question is actually probably for you, Sarah, is what types of buildings are currently located on the property? Um, well, there was a blog shack until one of the neighbor's sons burnt it down. <laughs> <laughs> Unnamed, of course. And um, then there are pump houses also on the property right now. And those are like wooden coverlets right. on the pumps. That's it. Okay. Are they still functioning, the sprinkler systems yes. and the engines are still there? So yes. they, they could function. Okay. Um, is there any bog maintenance or picking equipment included in the sale? No. Okay. If you want to buy it. Okay. It would be separate. <laughs> okay. So there's, it's nothing, they're not in the buildings right now. There's no storage no. building with equipment. No. We have them put away. Okay. All that, and all that property. All right. Are there chemicals stored in the building? No. All right. Now, have you guys been maintaining the bogs, or have you contracted the work out? The work has been contracted out to the gentleman that signed the purchase and sale. Okay. And he's handling all that right now, as well as the sprinklers, and he will be taking the um, cranberry crop to Ocean Spray, and he is a valid Ocean Spray grower. Perfect. Great. Okay. I think that's all I've got for you. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, will the, the town incur any cost to subdivide the land for house lots? There will be a survey. Okay. All right. You already talked about public access. 
All right, so we'll be taking the property off the tax roll, which would indirectly increase taxes, but the monies that would be gained by the sale of house lots should more than offset any loss in tax revenue, yes. correct? Is that correct? Yes. An accurate statement? Okay, perfect. All right. The tax income right now is to be about eight or 9000 from the bonds and Okay. All right. So it looks like, based on the letter from the Atwoods attorney, that the intent was it, the property is going to be sold for a non qualifying use. So they're planning on taking the whole parcel out of agriculture. 61A? That's what it appears? Are you talking about the current buyer? Or? Well, the current, look like the current. Um, the current letter from Cody and Cody says that, um, let's see, owner's statement of intent to sell the property for a disqualifying use, thereby triggering the statutory prescribed 100 day period. So it looks like they're taking the entire parcel out of 61A. Okay. If I may? Sure. Attorney Ashley Evers for the Abbott family from Cody, Cody McCarthy. Um, at the time of the submission per statute, we just have to let you know that yes, some not sure how much would be coming out. If it's all, that's something that um, the prospective buyer could weigh in on. But as far as our office is concerned, <coughs> we can't. Okay. We don't know. You weren't in a position to specify. No. Okay. All right. So, Linda, what's the proposed use for the property if the town were to purchase the property? Right now, and, and we think the back is conservation. Okay. That doesn't exclude that part of that would, could be used for educational purposes in the bogs and so on. And there are many examples of, of educational groups using anything like the local high school and other right. you know, groups working to really understand you know sort of natural bog biology and bringing people in and having some public education there. So that's sort of a loose discussion. It's obviously not the top of our concern right now. But right now. Um, this is a separate discussion that we can go at some other time. There are many experiences from other towns as well as nonprofits, um, and I was happy to be attached to a nonprofit that did this that had subcontracts with people running cranberry box, and they're not happy stories most of the time. Right. So, um, so this is something as a subset that we would have to explore. Okay. My big concern is I'm really I'm kind of, I'm on the fence. I would uh, I mean this is such a great opportunity, but I just don't want there to be any impact tax impact to residents. We can't afford it, and we have so many people struggling to make ends meet that this just it's extremely important that this doesn't negatively impact taxes. And where part do you see negative? Well, if we had to um, to borrow and say we weren't able to sell the house lots. You know that, and we ended up um, having to raise taxes that way. Well, again, from informal discussions with realtors and so on, sadly, well, whatever you want to look at, uh, apparently there's no concern that house lots would not just <laughs> they would move. Well, especially abutting a beautiful piece of property <laughs> that's in <laughs> conservation <laughs> land. So, and, uh, you know, okay, just, okay, yeah. all right. Those, I think that was pretty much it. For me, just that there were there is grant money available. You mentioned one that unfortunately just closed on the 12th. That well, we, we, were, we talked about months ago, but we, the, the key to that land grant was that it had to be you could not even consider no. purchasing anything until they gave you a grant award November 18th, mm -hmm. and then you had to work with them for the next six months to buy it. I said, but, but we have to buy it by November 1st. Right. And I said, well, yeah. mm -hmm. well, there is grant money for the purchase of protecting or land that would protect a potential public water supply. And that's, yeah. and that's, it, that's, it, that's the class two thing is up a bit north. That's a different discussion. We got yeah. Rick. Okay. Rick so that's all I've got. Thank you. Okay. So Rick, and then um, if you have questions, maybe you, and then we'll go to people that are opposed. Rick? Real quick, Rick Burnett, 270 on Main Street. Um, well worth project. Um, Christine, there is a right away into the property that comes across two other parcels that would follow okay. um, with the purchase of, of that land to give us access, vehicle access back to the bond. Um, there's also other parcels in the back that have access over that, over that land. Um, uh, as far as tax impact, one little caveat, <clears throat> an all CPA funded project does not affect any tax right. uh, and caution the board 
to think that they're going to rush into selling house lots quickly. I think you have to take a little longer approach on that. Things will go wrong. Things will go wrong. It's too, it's too critical of an area uh, in there where the houses would go to be able to just chop them up and, and, and say, uh, let's do this. So uh, let's take a little longer view if there was some, some borrowing or something that had to go on. Uh, just to be a little cautious with that. I'm, my questions were asked by Christine, but I'd be glad to <clears throat> chat so, about where I am when you're ready. All right. Um, why don't we uh, open it up for those that would like to speak uh, or, um, against the selectmen exercising their right of first refusal? Um, you might be in a minority or feel like you're in a minority in the room, but I, honestly, we'd like to hear from people if they have concerns or advice or suggestions. Um, this is the time, and this is the forum. Okay. All right. In that case, um, why don't we're going to um, close out the evidentiary part. Um, so one last chance, any comments or questions? At that point, we'll close the evidence part of the hearing, and then we will um, just uh, begin to deliberate. Hmm. Kelsey Pitts, 11 Road. Um, I brought my daughter in here first because I didn't have a babysitter on for the property. Um, but just to remind everyone that this is not just for us, it's for the future generation. Our kids, their kids, we're running out of open space. You know, there's construction everywhere. Um, emotional, but I live and looked at my entire life and opportunities have been stolen so often. So I hope you guys were able to consider this. Thank you. Uh, Alan. Alan, we walk 10 Center Street. If you guys do not take first refusal, is it possible that that gigantic sand pit will be created that was for poverty? That's a good question. I don't think Linda's going to field that one. <laughs> well, I don't know where we are with acceptance of the um, town's earth removal bylaw. Normally it takes four to six months. Uh, okay. The attorney general has to approve it. We have an existing bylaw. Um, it is probably fair to say that if people, uh, depending what they were planning to do with the land, and particularly if they were going to use it for cranberry, that there might be quite a bit of um, work done on the property. And there would be concern that the natural um, um, habitat, uh, the beauty, um, the protection of water resources might be in danger. I will say something that was in the appraisal. Um, and I think it was actually when uh, the first potential buyer was here, was it February, that we had a public meeting, and he was here too, but uh, the appraiser interviewed and went through all the um, notices. And uh, the, um, I remember I talked about the two hills when we were showing the slides. There are two hills that I, what was it, 77 feet, 66 feet or something. Those hills were, uh, I think it was the current buyer, did, they did go back in with the backhoe, and they did grade the soil, the sand back there, because uh, if you have a bog, the bogs out there are now created as in fair condition. And so if you want to renovate a bog, uh, you need sand. And so you take you want your sand to be on the property. So those two hills that are out there are prime hills for the sand. And they would come down, because that's what you need to sand. That's what the cranberries do. So uh, that, and if, uh, um, if they want to truck it off site, that would get the earth a little thing too. But, but you know, cranberries are, are uh, a crop that need a certain kind of soil, and they need to be rejuvenated a certain kind of way. And so these people who were looking at it were looking at, can I rejuvenate the, the, the crop? And those two hills are full of prime sand. So they will not look this way if it goes out of the direction. More prime filters. Sir. Just uh, one more comment, Mike, the new one for the Main Street Run. Not that it's directly related to this project, but as it creates revenue for the town, has there been any thought about some of the land that the town already owns that maybe isn't in an area that's uh, you know, extremely delicate or systemic to raise revenue and, and do affordable housing or something? Because I know there are 
vacant parcels the town owns that was brought up for vote a couple of years ago at town meeting that was passed on. Um, so when we think about unlocking potential or unlocking revenue for the town to help uh, forestall any tax increases, there are some options that could be looked into. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's been considered. Mm -hmm. We've been working on it actually for several years and it's a process and uh, it just seems like something keeps coming up that, that deters us from you know, completing that action, but it is something that we've been looking at, uh, disposing of um, town property, looking to see which is appropriate for affordable housing and utilizing those for that purpose, working with open space and recreation and identifying properties that would be more appropriate for their application. So it is something that we're looking at, we just have not finished the process. Sir? Yeah, David Zioli, uh, I want to know if maybe you could look at the possibility of taking those cranberry bogs and turning them into uh, a product for the schools. Because I know in my schools, I, I, as soon as I put the ocean spray cranberries out in the package, you can't keep up with them. And I thought maybe you could take those bogs and maybe put them into our public schools. <coughs> Well, actually, Brian Wick suggested something along that lines, partnering with Silver Lake, their agricultural program, if we were to try to keep the bogs and use them as a, um, a tool, a learning tool, and for the kids to actually farm the bogs. So, yeah, that's definitely something that's a possibility. Last client chance, one more question, comment, uh, ma'am. Uh, question as far as... Uh, for the board what I don't know if you've mentioned the end of the 120 day I know we're coming up on it because it's the beginning of August and here we are halfway through July so just to make sure I strongly urge you folks to make sure if the town goes forward working with town council because there's a lot that has to be done in a quick two and a half yeah we we um, um, stay up at night okay. worrying about that one. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Line, me too. Council, we just, you know. uh, the other item, I don't know if it's been mentioned, I, I know there was a lot of discussion, concern, issue with the first buyer, but I'm not sure if it's ever been said that this new buyer is not the same, not associated, completely separate, so I'm not sure if there's been any discussions with the new prospective buyer about what he intends to do. Okay. No. I don't think there has. Hi, I'm um, Marty Dormer, uh, Fort Thomas Blanchard uh, Drive, and a member of the Conservation Commission. Once land is taken out of Chapter 61, um, basically it could be used for anything. Um, a developer, hmm. developer could come in, do, do many house lots, um, you know, continue on with the bog um, work. But my experience in my neighborhood with the bog work, there's when they, the one access in my trucks. They have to come up through my neighborhood because they can't make the turn onto Prospect Street. They can't turn into it or off it. So there's a public safety issue there. If there's any chance that there's going to be large gravel trucks coming out of there um, when they remove, if they remove the uh, two hills of gravel. Um, the cost of the, the, the road repair from these gravel trucks would be far more than the cost of buying the land. Um, and, you know, any work on that property is going to require permitting. There's potential for appeals, attorney's fees, um, that will cost the town a lot of money. Um, so I think, I think $800,000 is probably cheaper um, to buy it than to let um, an un a developer or a new landowner go in there and um, potentially do something. Um, it's just going to be cheaper to buy it. <coughs> I'll give a negative review of the earth removal bylaw, right? Because Amy and I can. Do. We couldn't. Con we, we we tried to close up as many of the loopholes in the earth removal as best we could, you know. And I think we I think we did that. I think people have said it's the best one they've seen. But don't forget that there's this thing called the agri state agricultural law, and if there's if anyone runs a bog anywhere, not just not just this place, but uh, anyone who runs a bog who needs to have material to go to a different bog. It could be a mile away or 10 miles away or 30 miles away. They are allowed to take the material from bog A and truck it 10, 20, 30 miles to bog B. And that's why, if you know anything about Plymouth, why there's been such a hoo-ha in Plymouth, and they just tried again to get their earth removal under. Because um, not only the trucks driving all of it, they've lost you know, beautiful, beautiful topography. Their hills have just gone flat because it's legal under the state agricultural law to take down the hills here, put them in truck, 
and drive over here to Sandra Boggs. If you're the same owner, same ownership, you can do that. So just remember, that's an issue for us. And in most cases, the town is going to come you know, if we have a removal bylaw, we'll look at that and we build something in to negotiate with the owners, at least understand what they're doing, try to mitigate it on the neighborhoods. You know, we're doing everything we can in there. But in other cases, if we were to own the bog, that may not be the choice to make for all kinds of reasons, because you guys in your earth removal hats may be really busy then. Thank you. All right, we are going to close the evidentiary part of the hearing, and now we, the three selectmen, get to uh, deliberate. Can I ask a question? Sure. She mentioned the, the 120 days. It's 120 days for us to make a decision. We don't have to have a town meeting in 120 no. days. No, I, within 90 days after um, the uh, per a new purchase and sale is signed and recorded, within 90 days we have to close. Okay. All right. Um, in that time, we have a whole bunch to do, including the CPC process, including a special town meeting, and getting to closing. And 90 days seems like a lot, but it's nothing. Well, and I just didn't uh, want anybody to think we had to have this all done by August. Yeah. Because <laughs> that just would not happen. So thank you. Make a decision. Yeah, okay, after we give you the purchase so and sales, it wouldn't be just the vote, right? You'd actually have to have it in hand? Yeah. No, not the, my interest, I think we should check with town council of when that 90 days starts. Okay. Um, we've, we've had that discussion, and he felt like it was once the purchase and sale is agreed to. Um, and sign I by both parties. I would speak with them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons we're pushing right, right. now, and, because, and it is... Um, don't listen to this next comment, but it is interesting how often one speaks to three attorneys and there's three different answers. That old joke, I can't resist, that the best attorney is a one-handed attorney, so you don't get on the one hand this, on the <laughs> other hand that. Um, we can work with that. I know, there's, I know it's a, a gray area. Yeah. I would then humbly suggest that you not vote tonight until you know because you'd like to use as much of the... That's it of this 120 days. Mm -hmm. to no, 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 no. You don't think so? No, the 90 well, days starts when both parties have signed the purchase and sale. Yeah. We need you guys to do the right of first refusal now to take the first step to then looking at a slightly revised purchase and sale. You need to get our, give our lawyer time to fiddle around yeah. with some minor details there so we can get things over to you. Well, and start working on um, financing and everything yeah, else that, that needs but to I mean, be done. For the 120 days, by August 8th, we need to do right of first refusal, hopefully tonight, and then you may have some minor conversations with the lawyer about changing commas and, little, you know, how lawyers are. And then you'll come back and decide. <laughs> except, except, except you. you. Yeah. yeah, not you. <laughs> Our lawyers like it. And then, then you'll have to sign the purchase and sale. And then they have to sign the purchase and sale. So that's that 90 days starts when they've signed the purchase and sale. So you need to start tonight with the right of first refusal. It's the first toe in the water to get this done. Right. Well, I'm ready to make a decision. Okay. Um, and actually, those are the things we, I, I think we have left to do tonight is um, potentially vote um, and then um, see what we can do about scheduling an executive session to um, deal with spiffing up or polishing the last pieces of the okay. purchase and sale. And that's actually where it gets to be a little challenge with people away and et right. cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so... Um, would so, you like to comment? Yeah, a little bit. Um, when this first came before us, uh, we had a purchase and sale that was put in front of us for a million dollars. And it was clear that the person who was buying the land was going to be taking all the gravel out. Uh, we talked, I think they were talking as many trucks as they could get a day for five years. And they couldn't make the corner. They'd have to go up through Blanchard and come back down because of the turning radius. That, we had initially turned this down, or at least was inclined to turn this down because we said a million dollars. But then as it became clear of what this person wanted to do with the operation, we said we better reconsider this. I believe that it's not unreasonable to sell off three lots to reduce the amount of money that we would have to pay. 
CPC funds do, we do have enough money in there. But we have also other things that we're thinking about in the future. We're putting together a master plan for the, uh, what we call the campus here, we have 30 acres. We're thinking about f affordable housing, what that would fit into it. So there's, it's not like we don't have a reasonable use for funds in other places. I also take a little issue with the fact that CPC is not a tax. When it comes out of your pocket, every time you get a tax bill, somehow it's a tax. But I do think this is a good use of the money. I think if we can sell off the three lots, I think we can probably make this happen. If it turns out that in fact we get more money donated than what we've put in the proposal, great, maybe we only need to sell two lots. At the same time, we'll go out and look at grants, whether it be state grants or foundation grants. So I think this makes a lot of sense and I don't feel uncomfortable being able to go to town meeting and say this is something that we think is a good use of the town's resources, both financially and also to protect the environment. Um, there's gonna be lots of questions, but I think we're on the right track. And I appreciate all the work that Linda and her working committee has put in, lots of hours. It's clear that they have a vested interest in seeing the good things that can come to this town. There are a lot of very good brains on our working committee and our open space committee, so I'm just the mouthpiece, but there are a lot of very good brains behind the scenes. Comments? What? No. No comment. I, wow. Wow. <laughs> I don't. Shock wow. her. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I think this is a really unusual opportunity. Um, um, the land is really a beautiful treasure. It's quite cost effective. This is hard, hard work, and we have a long way to go to make it happen if, if we vote positively, but uh, it's absolutely worth it, I think. And um, I, I, I think it is clear we are very cognizant of taxpayers' dollars, and yes, CPC is funded um, by our taxpayer dollars, but we're talking about dollars that have already been paid in, so right. it's not. Um, uh, so I'm certainly in favor, and um, if you, or once you guys have no other comments, I'd be glad to make a motion. I have no other comments. All right, so I, um, this is where we get into the legalese again, and I, I in, in sort of language that even a selectman can understand, the, the motion is going to be to exercise our right of first refusal. Um, However, the language um, officially will be that I make a motion that the Board of Selectmen vote to approve exercising the town's right of first refusal option under Chapter 61A, Section 14, with regard to land off Prospect Street, Plan 44 of uh, 2018, Book 61, page 1120, owned by Sarah Preston, trustee of the Atwood um, Family Irrevocable Trust, as described in the letter to the town from Ashley Evans um, Esquire on April 10th, 2018, sucks exercise to be finally made in writing as required by the statute, if at all, upon the board's review and approval of the results of further inspection of the property as it deems warrant, warranted, and upon its determination of the terms of the purchase agreement to be sent with the required notice. Um, Can second. you read that again? <laughs> um, we, we don't pay by the word, actually, we sort of do pay it's by, by the, the concept. Word. Um, so that's the motion. We had a second. Uh, I was, all right. Uh, all those in favor? favor? Aye. All right. All right. Yay. Thank you for your good work. I think that's just one last concern. We really appreciate everyone coming out on a warm night and sitting in this room. Uh, it's uh, actually pretty sweet, the concerned, serious, uh, considered opinions that um, seem to come out of this room lately. And uh, you guys um, make that all happen. We're really appreciative. Um, so we need to schedule an executive session. Um, I hope... Um, our, our next meeting is scheduled for next Monday night, right. and there's been a little bit of question on whether we need that meeting or not. Okay. Um, 
Thank you for coming. If Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, now we get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, you guys will all disappear. But if you want to stay involved, Linda, people who want to help, who should they contact? Open space? Yeah, contact Open Space. Okay, contact Linda if you're interested in helping. Notes in the mailbox are good. <laughs> Um, these are live mics, but tell your neighbors, help us with uh, Good the to see you. <laughs> oh, you Christine? Yes, it certainly is. Nice to see you. Yeah, we've met. I know your daughter. Yeah. We're going to end up in the black. Pardon me? We're going to end up in the black. The food uh, service probably. Good. Awesome. I, I retired. Okay, good. Congratulations. Good to see you. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of debate on, on whether that meeting, I won't be at that meeting. Right, you won't be night, there. Which uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't have it. Um, because of these time constraints, we were hoping we could have an executive session Monday the 30th, two weeks from now, which would would normally have been our off week, but that only gives us eight days to spiff up the purchase. Why can't we do something the rest of this week? Yeah, what are we doing at the executive session? Um, um, there are, no. Yes, we are live. Um, and, um, it would be looking at any clauses that might want to be changed. Um, mostly, we have to take on the purchase and sale, but um, we should talk to, with the attorney. I can't do Wednesday night, but you, what you about name Thursday? It. Do you have? Are you available on the nineteenth? I am available. Unfortunately, um, town council is not available that night. He would be available during the day for a phone conference, which he's okay with. But um, yeah. uh, you're away next week. Yeah, yeah, the whole week. Yes. Do we all need to be here? Right. To be um, with council. You have to be here. Mike. No, I, I, I. We don't, and you know. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, on the 19th, because we are all available, just council is right? Council is and we kind of need him. Yeah, we do. But John's not no, available on the 18th, and it's really too late to post that now anyway. Um, what about, like, the 24th? Are you gone that whole week? Uh, or 20... <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm unavailable. You're unavailable the whole week. Okay. Uh, that's why we got to the 30th. And I, you know, there's plenty of time. Are you doing it on a sad day? Is that reasonable? What's that? A sad day? Or can you guys do it during the day? We can. I mean, I'm why don't much you two open. meet we could, with we could do it Thursday. during the day Thursday? Um, he volunteered as a phone thing. Yeah. Why don't you do that? I'm out of town. I can be back by the afternoon. 